We come to Rahab. It says remarkable grace. This is not about grace of Rahab. This is about the grace of God. Remarkable as it is displayed in Rahab's life. It's a verse in Psalm 89 that has several attributes of God. And I think in this story, we see every one of these attributes of God in one way or another. The verses say, Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth go before thy face. We see all of these attributes of God as we go through this story. I'm going to start with some historical background. Um, a lot of people have very much difficulty with stories like the destruction of Jericho, of God telling the Israelites to kill all of those people. And I want to try to get some historic background and some reasoning uh, and, and some things about Rahab as we look at some of this history. So we're going to start with verses about the Genesis flood. In Genesis 6, the Lord says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord said he was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, for I am sorry that I have made them. And the next phrase says what? But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We know that Noah preached for 500 years as he built the ark. And nobody except his own family came into the ark with him. When you come to the destruction of, the, of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord says, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but he says, I'm, I'm not going to hide this from Abraham because Abraham needs to be able to teach his family, his people, uh, about this sin, about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah so that they can avoid all of these things so that I will be able to bless Abraham. And we know that Abraham argued with God and said, can we just find ten people and what they couldn't find ten people and it's also true that lot almost had to be dragged kicking and screaming out doesn't it doesn't he and he says couldn't i go to a little city i always wonder if what he wanted was ease you know he he always wanted an easier life but anyway there's a very interesting verse in second peter that says who turned the cities of sodom and gomorrah into ashes condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Now you don't see that on the outside, do you? But God could see Lot's righteous heart, and he delivered Lot from Sodom. Now we need to look a little bit at the Abrahamic covenant. We studied in the story with Sarah and some of the others that we've had, how Abraham left Ur, went up into Syria, stayed there till his father died, and then finally went down to Canaan. And when he got to Canaan, it's when you have this covenant made. And... The Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto this seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt, that is the Nile, to the great river, the river Euphrates. He said, I have given it to you. But then he said, but not now. And the verses say, He said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. What, what is that? That's Egypt. And they will serve them. They became slaves in Egypt. And they will afflict them 400 years. 
and the nation whom they serve I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Is that not intriguing? He said, it's not to a point yet where I need to destroy these people. He gave them time. And it's interesting, if you figure up the time from the Abrahamic covenant till they go to Egypt, the 400 years in Egypt, the 40 years in the wilderness, it's at least around 500 years that God gives them in this time period before the Israelites return and he tells them to destroy these nations. And it's interesting that four generations, I looked up and um, from Jacob, Jacob, Judah, per and Perez were in the group that went to Egypt. And then Herzon, Ram, Abinadab, and Nashon were, be were born in Egypt. And that's when they came out, Nashon being the leader of Judah as they came out. So the four generations born in Egypt, and then they came out. So people live longer then for four generations to be born. It's 400 years. Now, the Israelites were commanded to destroy the inhabitants completely. In Deuteronomy, when they're giving the um, instructions to Israel before they enter the land, God says, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abomination of these nations. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations God promised to Abraham had become, as MacArthur says in his chapter on Rahab, the nations had become a pagan culture that was fanatically devoted to everything God hates. The culture itself was on the brink of judgment, their long descent into the abyss of moral and spiritual corruption had been intentional, and now it was irreversible. So that's where our story begins. Israel has been told to come into the land to destroy the idol-worshipping, licentious people of Israel, and they have conquered the land to the east of the Jordan River, and they had made camp seven miles from Jericho, but on the other side of the river. They were still on the east side of the river Jericho, on the west side of the river. Now, they were there for a period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but God lets Moses go into the mountains and view the land, and then he dies, and then they have 30 days of mourning. And it's... Um, in this period of time that they're on the opposite side of the river that Joshua sends the two spies to Jericho. Now, he did not send those spies to try to formulate a battle plan because later on Joshua meets with, they call him the commander of the Lord's army, but all of my study Bibles say it's a Christophany, an appearance of Christ, and he tells them how to conquer Jericho. But I think it's interesting when he tells the spies to go spy out the land, what does he say? Go view the land, what? Especially Jericho. Why especially Jericho? Because Rahab's there. You see, God saw Rahab just like God saw Noah. And just like God saw Lot, God saw Rahab. And that is astonishing. But just like Lot living among the people that he lived with, we would not look at Rahab and think God should do anything special for Rahab, would we? But we're going to go in deeper now into Rahab's story. Rahab the harlot. She's called that every time in Scripture except in Matthew 1. Every other time. It always says Rahab the harlot. 
There's no backstory given in scripture. We don't know how or why she became a prostitute. It was not unusual in the time for a father to sell a daughter into prostitution. Uh, I somehow doubt that happened. I don't know why, because her father at least comes to her when she asks him to, but uh, I, I don't know. We don't know. People speculate. There are all kinds of stories. If you read novels, you've read, I read three, and they were all different on how she became a prostitute. We do not know the answer to that. There are two Hebrew words for prostitute, and one of them is the temple prostitutes who took part in the licentious worship of the day, and that word is never used about Rahab. And some authors seem to think that's a, uh, something in her favor. Um, I, I, anyway, I'll just stop there. Um, Rahab had a house built in the city wall. Some translations say that this was an inn, and it well could have been. Uh, built into the wall, close to the gate, would have been a good location for an inn. She seemed to know a lot, and uh, she knew all about the nations they had conquered east of, of the river, and that they had destroyed everything completely. So she heard things, but uh, we don't really know. But there's no doubt she was a prostitute. The scripture said she was. I think it's evident that she has maintained a good relationship with her family. She has brothers, plural, sisters, plural. They have children, and they all agree to come when she tells them what's going to happen. And you know, what did Lot's family do when he told them they got to leave? They laughed at him, didn't they? Since they laughed at him, it seemed as one who mocked. So I think that that's a mark in Rahab's favor that she, she did have a good relationship with her parents and siblings. Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith in the Scripture, says that Rahab's faith saved her. The verse says, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. Now what was her faith? What did Rahab <coughs> believe? Joshua 2, 8 to 11 says, <clears throat> She came up to them on the roof and said to the men, This is what she believed. I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you <coughs> came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites on the other side of Jordan. Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, this really brings up some interesting questions. She says everybody was scared to death. Well, why weren't they trying to get help? It's an interesting question. The coming out of Egypt and drying up the Red Sea would have probably been before she was born, long before she was born. They were still talking about it. There's a very interesting Psalm 106. It's one of those that kind of catalogs all the events in in Israel's history and they would sing it you know to keep the stories alive and as we had in in uh, Shay's lesson last week you know the the Egyptians coming well God opening the Red Sea them coming across then the waters covering the Egyptian army and then Miriam wrote the song well the the, the Psalm 106 puts it this way then they believed his word and they sang his praise but you know what the next verse says they soon forgot. Now, did they not remember that they crossed the Red Sea on dry land and watched Egypt's army get destroyed? No, they remembered it, but they didn't apply it. Three days later, they're saying, God brought us out here to kill us. We're going to starve to death or we're going to thirst to death. 
when the spies came back with the report of how wonderful the land is, but they're giants and fortified cities, what they say? No way. They said, no way in the world can we conquer that land. You see, they didn't apply what God had done for them. But Rahab did. You see? Rahab did. She saw what God had done when she heard about the destruction of those nations across the Jordan River. She knew she had no hope except in Israel's God. Why does fear not lead to faith? Well, there's some interesting passages. James 2 says, Even fallen angels affirm the oneness of God and tremble at its implications. Demons are essentially orthodox in their doctrine. But orthodox doctrine by itself is not proof of saving faith. They knew the truth about God, Christ, and the Spirit, but they hate it and them. That was from my MacArthur Study Bible. John 3, 19, 20 says, This is the con condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. So all these people in Jericho were scared, but they didn't want to trust God. They didn't want to turn from their evil, you see. Now James says Rahab proved her faith by her works. James 2.25 says, Likewise, Rahab the harlot was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. We believe that this happened very quickly. The Israelites came through the gate. The guards recognized them as Israelites. They went to Rahab's house. The guards sent word to the king, and the king sent people to Rahab's house. We believe that that happened very quickly, that as soon as these men came, Rahab realized the danger and sent them up to her roof and hid them. Now, at this time, Rahab has no promise from them. She, has, she probably would have gotten a large reward if the men had come to the door and said, we hear there are Israelite spies here, and she said, yes, I have them on the roof. She would have probably been. Now, what if the spies had found, what if the guards had found the spies? What would have happened to Rahab? She would have been killed. Undoubtedly, she would have been killed. So she risked her life. She gave up large reward and hid these men with no promise whatever. That is proving your faith by your works, is it not? Now, there's a lot of talk about the lying, and I imagine some of you talked about it at your table. Been talking about it for centuries. Rahab lied. The midwives lied. We had that story. You think about the people hiding Jews. Would they have the Nazis knock on the door and say, oh, yes, I have them in the attic? No. Um, some people say it's a military tactic. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Is it wrong in battle? You know, you have all those questions. I, I don't have answers. Rahab had a pagan morality. She knew nothing of God's law. And it's interesting to me that the scriptures never talk about it. They never mention the lying, whether to say it was good or bad. I mean, they just ignore it, that she lied. I love this verse, and I always come to this when this question comes up. And I say, in extenuating circumstances, the Holy Spirit will guide us. There's a verse in John 16 that says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. We can't imagine being in a circumstance where lying would save a life, ours or somebody else's. But I think the Holy Spirit living in us will let us know what to do if that ever happens, which is highly impro improbable. 
Okay, now we come to Rahab's request. She says to the spies, Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Swear to me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver us from death. That was the request she made of the spies. And the spies say, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come to the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you will let us down. And unless you bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, and it shall be that whoever goes outside the door of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from the oath which you have made us. I was so struck when I read that of the similarity when the Passover happened in Egypt, the 10th plague, when God is going to send the death angel um, and kill the Egyptians and one, the oldest child in every family. And he says to the Israelites, take a bunch of hyssop. Just think of the parallel here. Dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and doorposts with the blood. And no one shall go out of the door of the house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood, the red mark on the lintel and the doorpost, the Lord will pass over and not allow the destroyer to come into the house. It's just interesting to me how the thing about staying in the house, don't go out of the house, put the red on the door, and and that cord that they use had to be the red cord because it ties us to our salvation, our salvation through the blood of Christ had to be a red cord. Now sometime in the future, Rahab is going to stand in front of a priest She's going to have her hand on the head of a lamb, a spotless lamb, and she's going to watch as that priest kills that lamb, and she's going to be forgiven. And I thought of that. There's so many wonderful hymns about grace, but the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds what? Sin and what else? Guilt, is that not marvelous? This woman was able to live without guilt. We can't even fathom it, can we? We cannot fathom it. <coughs> now, God still saves sinners of every lifestyle. Notice this verse that Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And what's the next verse say? And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's one of my very favorite passages in all of the New Testament. God still saves sinners of all kinds, and he saves them completely. He removes their sin and their guilt by his marvelous grace. I wanted to take a side step here and say, God does not categorize sin in the New Testament. Now, in the law, there are severe penalties for more things, and there are less penalties for other things, and, you know, the, there are some categorization, categorization of, of the sin. But when you read the list in the New Testament, like in Romans 1, let's look at this list. And because they did not like to acknowledge God, 
God gave them over to a based mind to do what was fitting. Now listen, they are filled with unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness. They're full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit and malice, gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do the same, but applaud those who practice them. Now, if we were making a list of sins worthy of death, we we wouldn't put some of those things in it, would we? We'd have our list. You know, these are the really bad things. But these... Hmm. There's an interesting book um, came out about 15 years ago, Respectable Sins, by Jerry Bridges. He's a man that, that wrote um, with Tim LaHaye in the... Um, the uh, rapture series uh, but anyway in this book he tries to let it let us know that God hates sin even some that we consider respectable I'm going to read a paragraph from the introduction to this book the idea of sin has largely disappeared from our culture and been softened in many churches so that no one is made uncomfortable the concept of sin among some conservative Christians has been redefined to cover only the obvious gross sins of our society. For many morally upright believers, the awareness of personal sin has effectively disappeared from their conscience. It has not disappeared from the sight of God. Rather, all sin, both the so-called respectable sins of the saints which we too often tolerate, and the flagrant sins of society, which we're quick to condemn, disregard the law of God and are reprehensible in his sight. Both deserve the curse of God. Now, when you get time, you can look in the bibliography. I listed several of the chapters in this book, um, the kinds of things it deals with, like lack of patience, <coughs> and arguing and anger and all of those things. And then there's a whole section on how to deal with those things in your life. It's not just identifying them. Identifying them, I think, is acknowledging them is important first, but then how to deal with them. I just thought I would recommend that book to you if you're interested in studying further um, about what we would call more respectable sins. It's easy to condemn prostitution. Is it as easy to condemn anger and selfishness? Now we come to Jericho. God stopped the Jordan River while it was flooding, and they crossed on dry land. Remember, they collected the large stones and carried them over and made the monument. Now they're seven miles from Jericho, Everybody in Jericho knew this. Everybody knew it. And again, there's a period of time because none of the people on the 40 years in the wilderness had been circumcised. So at this point, all the men had to be circumcised and then they all had to heal. You can't go fighting a war. And they had Passover. And this is the time period when Joshua met with the commander of the Lord's army and got the blueprint for the battle of Jericho, odd that it was. Uh, he got that. So there's another period of time here where all these people who are in that walled city shaking in their boots or whatever they wore um, could have come out and said, you know, can you make us one of you? But nobody did. They, they depended on their wall. They thought their city was, it was the most heavily fortified city in Israel. And they depended on their wall. So they practiced with their arrows and whatever while they waited. Uh, can't imagine what that wait was like, probably several weeks. 
Now, the way God conquered Jericho was done so that <clears throat> it could leave no doubt that God did it without human help. The walls fell when God commanded them to. Now, if you're interested in archaeological studies, you have to be very careful because a lot of them are intent on disproving the scripture. And they will do things and they will write things that to try to say couldn't have happened the way it says in the Bible. You very often find that. And I listed for you there the site, Associates for Biblical Research, that I think was the best one that I found. I couldn't say I didn't read all of them, but it's the best one I found. And the site there, they call it a tell. I'm not sure where that or, word origin is, but they call an archae archaeological site a tell. Maybe because it's telling them things about the past, I don't know. Anyway, it's about a mile from the city of Jericho today. You know, there is a city of Jericho. Remember, Jesus went there, found um, Zacchaeus in a tree, and um, you have uh, Paul going there. On Oh, that was Damascus, wasn't it? Was it Jericho? Anyway, you see the city in the New Testament, and it's there today. And this site that this place is writing about is a mile from there. <clears throat> and here's an excerpt from that website. According to the Bible, Rahab's house was incorporated into the fortification system. If the walls fell, how was her house spared? The spies had instructed Rahab to bring her family into her house and they would be rescued. When the Israelites stormed the city, Rahab and her family were saved as promised. At the north end of the tell of Jericho, archaeologists made some astonishing discoveries that relate to Rahab. The German excavation of 1907 to 1909 found that on the north, a short stretch of the lower city wall did not fall as everywhere else. A portion of that mud brick wall still stood to a height of eight feet. What is more, there were houses built against the wall. It is quite possible that this is where Rahab's house was located. Since the city wall was formed, formed the back wall of the houses, the spies could have escaped. From this location on the north of the city, it was a short distance into the hills of the Judean wilderness where the spies hid for three days. So that's in that uh, long website. It, it describes everything about the walls, how they were built, what they're made of, and all that kind of thing. If you want to read, you're welcome to. So Joshua told the spies to go get Rahab and her family. And he says, in Joshua 6, it says, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the, women, the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp. They had to be outside the camp for a long period of time there. And they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver, gold, vessels of bronze and iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now we come to Salmon, Salmon, Prince of Judah. I'm not going to read the passage in Matthew. You're very familiar with it, and I don't want to have to say all the names, but it shows you um, Salmon and Rahab. It mentions the women. It doesn't mention all the women, does it? But it mentions her. Nashon, Salmon's father, he was the leader of the tribe of Judah, and Judah was the largest tribe. So Nashon was, in fact, one of the most important men in the nation of Israel. There are some verses that say when, they, when the Israelites were camped, on the, the, that Judah was to be on the east side toward the rising of the sun, and those of the standards of the forces with Judah shall camp according to their armies. And Nashon, the son of Amminadab, shall be the leader of the children of Judah. When they marched, Judah went first. 
and they carried their standard, and it says, and the leader of the army was Nishan, the son of Abinadab. So, Salmon is not some insignificant person, you see. Now, look at another thing. Aaron, the brother of Moses, priest of Israel, was Salmon's uncle. Exodus 6.23, Aaron took to himself Eli. Eli, I can't read this. I can't see it. I keep wanting to hold it up. Elisheba, the daughter of Amenadab, the sister of Nashon, his wife, and it lists their children. So, uh, Salmon grew up calling Aaron Uncle Aaron, you know, the high priest of Israel. Again, he's not an insignificant person. God did not say to Rahab, now, I'm going to let you into Israel, but you've got to remember what you were. And be content to just be here. He didn't tell her she needed to go sit in, in dust and ashes all her life. Salmon married her. Now, Salmon is never listed as the leader of Judah. His father would be dead by now, of course, because all, all of them died. But you see, Caleb is from Judah. Joshua is from Ephraim, the two major tribes. We learned when we studied Rebekah. Um, and so Caleb is the elder. I mean, he's what, 30, 40 years older than all these people. And he is obviously the leader because he's the elder of Judah at this time. On Friday at Ron Countryman's funeral, um, Pastor Todd sang, Jesus paid it all beautifully. And when he, you know, my mind is in this period of time so full of Rahab, you know, she's hardly ever out of my thoughts. And when he sang, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, I, I just started weeping. And I had to put that line in the lesson. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. God richly blessed Rahab in Israel. Salmon chose her for his wife. Was he one of the spies? Well, makes a good story. We don't know. I wish we knew. God chose her as a great-great-grandmother to King David and a many times great-grandmother to his son. God's forgiveness is complete. He can take away our sin and our guilt so that the past does not overshadow our lives. Broken pieces put together to make a beautiful picture of grace. I brought some things that, that my husband Lance has done for friends. This bowl was in um, eight pieces. I've got pictures of the pieces here, but Lance put this back together. Is it not lovely? This is Charlotte McGarry's. We got it on a trip, that, and uh, she bought that outside of Ephesus, a little shop where the lady had made everything in the shop. I bought a teapot. This is a sugar bowl that um, a friend's husband broke and it was an heirloom of her great-grandmother and Lance fixed it you see I have some other pictures here there's a there's a Japanese art and I have the name down if you want to google it Kintsugi you can see some things that look like they ought to be in a museum but they use gold dust, real gold, powdered and put into a lacquer, and they use that to glue things together, expensive pottery, and it makes even the cracks, the scars, look like beautiful things, you see? And that, to me, is the picture of God mending a life, making even the scars to be beautiful things. I want to close with a Spurgeon devotion on Rahab. She bound the scarlet line in her window. Rahab depended on the promise 
of the two spies whom she looked upon as the representatives of Israel's God. Her faith was simple and firm, but it was very obedient. To, th to tie the scarlet line in the window was a very trivial act in itself, but she dared not risk omitting it. Come, my soul, <clears throat> is there not a lesson for you here? Have you been attentive to all thy Lord's will, even though some of his commands should seem non-essential? Have you observed in his own way the two ordinances of believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper? These neglected argue much unloving disobedience in your heart. Be henceforth in all things blameless, even to the tying of a thread, if, the, if it is a matter of command. But the act of Rahab sets forth a yet more solemn lesson. Have I implicitly trusted in the precious blood of Jesus? Have I tied the scarlet cord as with a Gordian knot in my window so that my trust can never be removed? The passerby can see a cord of so conspicuous a color if it hangs from the window. It will be well for me if my life makes the efficacy of the atonement conspicuous to all onlookers. What is there to be ashamed of? Let men or devils gaze if they will. The blood is my boast and my song. My soul, there is one who will see that scarlet line. Even when from weakness of faith thou canst not see it thyself. Jehovah, the avenger, will see it and pass over you. Jericho's walls fell flat. Rahab's house was on the wall, yet it stood unmoved. My nature is built into the wall of humanity. Yet when the destruction smites the race, I shall be secure. My soul, tie the scarlet thread in the window afresh and rest in peace. I love that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the redeemed life of Rahab. We thank you for the mentions where her life is explained in the New Testament to us. We thank you that you saw that she wanted to be, be part of your people, that she believed that you were the God in heaven, the God of earth, and she won wanted to worship this God rather than the vile abominations of the people around her. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to live our lives so that the scarlet thread of thy salvation is evident to anyone who meets us. We pray and we thank you for your blessing of your word and the stories that you tell us to teach us all of these lessons. In Jesus' name, amen.